Right, good evening, Holy Cross. Welcome to our Good Friday uh, worship here uh, at the church, uh, the day that we remember uh, when Jesus uh, went to the cross and died in our place uh, for our sins. Uh, and so uh, what I always like to say about the Good Friday service is it, uh, it's not a somber service because I don't know that Christians should ever be somber, but it is a serious service uh, in that uh, we're contemplating uh, the... Um, the death of our Lord, uh, and so uh, that goes uh, in, in all of that. Uh, I would remind you that uh, we do have uh, here at the church uh, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, uh, we will have our Easter egg hunt for the kids. Uh, we are moving it inside. Uh, we've made that determination, and so we are still going to have it, though. So please uh, bring your kids, bring your grandkids, spread the word a little bit. Uh, we are... Uh, looking forward to that as a, um, a thing for us and for our community uh, to, be, to be involved in. Uh, and then we, of course, have our worship services on Easter Sunday. Uh, sunrise is at 7, uh, and then our regular festival worship uh, is at 10.30. So uh, I'd invite you to avail yourself of that. There will also be, and just so you know, those of you with uh, little ones, uh, there will be a time near the end of the service uh, where there is a loud noise uh, to uh, remind us of Jesus' death and the closing of the tomb. So um, most of you know about when that happens. It's, again, toward the end after we do the seventh word of Christ from the cross. So uh, just with the little ones, just have them ready for that, um, and, and we'll do it that way. I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and stand, and we'll sing our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is put away.
holy death of our Lord Jesus Christ on this good day was for you. In his stead and by his command, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you willed that your Son should bear for us the pains of the cross, and so remove from us the power of the adversary. Help us so to remember and give thanks for our Lord's passion, that we may receive forgiveness of sin and redemption from everlasting death, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And please be seated for the reading of scripture. The Old Testament lesson from Isaiah 52 and 53. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. For, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And this is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from Hebrews chapter 4 and chapter 5. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears 
to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And this is the word of the Lord. And please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 23rd chapter. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, when the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw what had taken place, He praised God, saying, Certainly, this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked him for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb cut in stone where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb, And how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated and we sing the hymn. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. How did we get here? How did we get to the point that Jesus Christ, our Savior, should be crucified as a criminal among criminals? When Holy Week started, people were singing their praises to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. But in just a few days, their cry now is crucify. Crucify him. Jesus was not saved from the sentence of death. You know, it's notable in the crucifixion story here of Jesus, how many people recognized his innocence. Pilate said, I find no guilt in this man. Uh, One of the thieves on the cross indeed said, this man has done nothing wrong. Even at the trial that Jesus goes through, we're told they have false witnesses, people lying, people making it up. You you, you don't lie. It's not a lie unless you know the truth, right? 
They knew he didn't do these things. And yet, Jesus goes to the cross. Meanwhile, that crowd that was singing Hosanna, now they're singing a different tune. If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Are you not the Messiah? Said the other criminal up there with him. Save yourself and us. He saved others. Isn't he the Messiah? Isn't he the Savior? These are not serious questions, right? These are questions meant to mock Jesus and to make sport of him. The fact that death claims the life of Jesus, though, is a seed of the good news, a seed of God's amazing grace. For as the seed of his body falls in death, it will spring forth with a harvest of life. Now I mentioned the the one criminal who blasphemed against Jesus. There's uh, the criminal on the other side who demonstrates to us this amazing story of grace. And again, he has nothing to offer but he is one who recognizes the innocence of Jesus as well. And in fact, as the other thief is mocking Jesus, he says to him, do you, do you not fear God? As you're here making fun of Jesus? And yeah, he's not talking to Jesus, he's talking to the other guy. And whatever these thieves may have stolen in life, they cannot steal of their lives and of its meaning. Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? You know, we have this idea of the fear of the Lord. Dr. Luther obviously talks about it. We are to fear and love God so that. And it's this idea of acknowledging the Lord's power, acknowledging his holiness, acknowledging who he is and I'm not afraid of it in the way I'm afraid of a you know a criminal with a gun but there's respect there's recognition that the God I worship has the power of life and death and in this moment he exerts that power of death over his only son The other thief goes on, we, we indeed have been condemned justly for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. He, he knows. He knows he's been caught red-handed. Yet for the other thief, and, and frankly for all of us, the reason for judgment is now laid bare. We indeed have been condemned justly. We are getting what we deserve for our deeds But this man, Jesus, has done nothing wrong. What did Paul say in Romans 3? The wages of sin is death. When it comes to justice, which is something we often cry out for, final final justice is not something that we can bear fully in this life. It mortifies us ultimately, literally. It judges sinners for the wrongs that they've done, not just in our deeds, in our thoughts, our words, our motives. That's who we are in a fallen world. It's who we are when we look back at our first parents, Adam and Eve. But this man has done nothing wrong. It's remarkable. So we've got this judged criminal, and he's speaking to his fellow judged criminal, uh, or criminals, if we include ourselves in that department, and he's calling his attention to the one who's in the middle. 
and he's saying he's talking about the innocence of Jesus, which even the centurion recognized, which other folks recognized. If Jesus is innocent, then why is he here? Why is he being crucified? Why is he dying for the likes of us? It's a good question. A question with an answer, though. It's because Jesus shares in the sufferings of sinners. He did it all throughout his earthly life and his ministry. He made their sufferings his own. And he makes our sufferings his own, too. So here, he shares in death with those charged with condemnation as their just deserts. Jesus is not saved from death because he makes our death his own. He bears our death on himself. And what he gives us in return is saving innocence. We receive his grace. This is what Dr. Luther called the great exchange. That is that he gets our wrath and we get his grace. He gets our condemnation. We get his saving. Again, it's remarkable. And because of that, we can say, with that thief on the cross, we can say, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And this thief on the cross, he doesn't ask to be set free from death. He knows that that sentence has already been passed and that that process is already in play. What does he say, though? He says, remember me. What do we mean when we say remember? Right? Remember. Make me a member again with you and with the Lord. Make me whole again is his prayer. Do not forget me in my sin and death. No. Keep me as your own. Keep me as a child of God. May I receive that inheritance of faith and hope. Keep me, Lord Jesus, with you. And Jesus replies, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Paradise, a place of peace and wholeness. This is what he promises. And it comes for him. What are we free from because of Jesus? There's a number of things. I'll just give you a couple here. We're free from sin and death. We're free from judgment and guilt and condemnation. We're free from all that would criticize and mortify and humiliate us in life. For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No, we're all brought from death into life through the one who is with us, Jesus Christ. The one who's with us even in death on the cross. That same blessing of grace was pronounced upon us in our baptism. When we died to sin and rose to Christ. And even so in death. It is the final crossing of that promise of our baptism that now comes to fruition. Jesus remembers us and does so with his amazing grace. And it's for his beautiful name. Amen. Well, now worship the Lord with our offerings. Uh, we invite you to fill out those communication cards uh, as well. We'll do that now.
continue with the prayers, I would invite you to stand. Dear Lord Jesus, that there had to be a day when you, the eternal Son of God, would be made sin for us is not good. But at the same time, that you freely and gladly gave yourself for us on the cross is ultimate goodness. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord Jesus, from the cross you uttered these two impassioned cries, Father, forgive them, and my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The first, our forgiveness, required the second, your God-forsakenness. Therefore, these cries humble our hearts and ignite our faith. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord Jesus, you cried, it is finished. You left nothing undone. We are redeemed, reconciled, renewed, and resurrection is most certainly coming. You became the just for the unjust, the beautiful one for the broken ones, the way for the lost ones, the savior for the sinners, the lamb of God for the rebels from God. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord Jesus, thousands of years into our life in the new heaven and new earth, we will still be stunned with awe, worship, and gratitude for the greatness of your sacrifice and love for us. You exhausted God's judgment against our numberless sins. Amen. And please be seated. <laughs> And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people, and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wounds that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things, when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right, and one on his left, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The first word.
cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanging railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we, indeed, justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The second word. standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. The third word. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fourth word. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. The fifth word.
Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit, the sixth word. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, when the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last, the seventh word. Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with them, keeping watch over Jesus, <clears throat> saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God.
since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs may be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as in the burial custom of the Jews. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. 